Hello and welcome everybody to the new National Trends in Disability Employment or NTIDE Lunch and Learn series. On the first Friday of every month, corresponding with the Bureau of Labor Statistics Jobs Report, we'll be offering this live broadcast via Zoom webinar to share the results of the latest NTIDE findings. In addition, we will provide news and updates from the field on disability employment, as well as host panelists who will discuss current disability-related findings and events. So just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Um, we will post an archive of each of our webinars each month at our website, www.researchondisability.org backslash NTIDE. Uh, this site will also provide copies of the presentations today, the panelist bios, full transcripts, and other valuable resources. As an attendee of this webinar, you are a viewer and no sound is enabled. To ask questions of the panelists, simply click on the Q&A box on your webinar screen and type your questions into the box. Panelists will review these questions during the assigned question and answer periods. Mm -hmm. So welcome to our September Lunch and Learn. I'm glad you could join us. My name is Deb Brucker, and I have the pleasure of filling in for Andrew Houghtonville today. I'd like to jump right in as we have a great program for you today. Just as a reminder, this Lunch and Learn occurs noon Eastern on the day that the NTIDE report is released, which is our jobs report for people with disabilities. It's a joint effort of the UNH Institute on Disability, Kessler Foundation, and the Association of University Centers on Disability. As part of the Rehabilitation and Research Training Center on Employment Policy and Measurement, which is funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. Our agenda for today, we'll start with our NTIDE monthly report. John O'Neill from the Kessler Foundation and I will review the findings that we shared today through our press release. Part two will include NTIDE news and a guest interview. Denise Rozelle from Association of University Centers on Disability, and she will be interviewing Erin Hawley. And part three will be our guest speaker, Donna Smith from the Easter Seals Project Action Consulting. Just as a reminder, we'll answer Q&A for all parts of the program at the end. If you have questions, you're welcome to use the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen to submit some questions. So at this point, I'd like to hand it over to John O'Neill from the Kessler Foundation. Good day, everybody. Um, as Deb mentioned, I'm John O'Neill from the Kessler Foundation. Um, next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, one back. One back. Thank you. That's good. Um, the monthly Intide report uh, it, it contains a press release and an infographic uh, where we are looking at the latest uh, employment statistics, uh, which include the um, employment to population ratio as well as the employment participation rate. Um, it uses data from the jobs report, uh, also known as the Employment Situation Summary, which is released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics on the first Friday of each month. Uh, as Deb mentioned, this is a joint effort and, uh, of the Kessler Foundation and the University of New Hampshire, and we've been uh, engaged in this joint effort uh, efforts since uh, early 2003. Next slide, please. Uh, the source of the data that we use is uh, the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics Current Population Survey. Uh, it's the source of the official unemployment rate. And um, this uh, survey is administered to civilians uh, ages 16 to 64 who are not living in institutions. 
And the information, um, this information has been available since uh, September 2008 onward, uh, when the Bureau of Labor Statistics added the six disability questions uh, to the current population survey. The data is not seasonally adjusted, and that is why um, that is why we compare the current month to the same month last year. Okay, Deb, I'd like to turn it over to you and you can report the numbers. Great, thank you, John. So our results today, we had increases in the employment to population ratio for persons with disabilities. Um, it increased from 27.2 in August 2016 to 29.5% in August 2017. And again, this is the percent of working age persons with disabilities that are employed. Um, this was an increase of 8.5% or 2.3 percentage points. And just to translate this into some different numbers, um, this reflects about 4.6 million persons with disabilities that were in the workforce in August 2017. There was similarly an increase for workers without disabilities um, from 73% in August 2016 to 73.6% in August 2017. The labor force participation rate, which includes people that are working as well as looking for work, also increased for persons with disabilities from 2016 to 2017, increasing from 31% in August 2016 to 32.5% in August 2017. Again, that was an increase over last year. Um, for persons without disabilities, there was a slight increase as well in their labor force participation rate. So while the increases are good overall, you can see that there's still a large gap remains between uh, employment and labor force participation for people with and without disabilities. The slide I'm showing now shows the trend in the employment to population ratio from 2008 to 2017. Um, and it shows that for people without disabilities, the employment to population ratio of 73.6% is nearly at the level that it was before the recession in 2008. Um, for persons with disabilities, the current employment to population ratio of 29.5% is still below the rate that it was before the recession, which was 32.7. So there's still gains that need to be made for persons with disabilities. So those were our employment and labor force participation numbers that we reported today in our end tide report. I'd like to turn it over now to Denise at the Association of University Centers on Disability. Hey everybody. So I'm Denise Roselle. I'm from the Association of University Centers on Disability. And today's stuff that we're going to be talking about is all about leverage. That's my key word for the day. So keep that in mind. Um, next slide, Deb. The first thing we're going to talk about while Deb's getting the slide. Hmm. Okay, there it is. So uh, remember I said leverage. So the idea today is there are some studies that are newly out and papers that are newly out that you can use to leverage when you talk about the work that you're doing on employment um, with other either policymakers or uh, businesses, et cetera. The first one is a state federal partnership on workforce development and training. Now, and there's links for all of these. Uh, when you download your slides, the links for the studies are in there. This is a joint effort of the National Governors Association and the National Association of State Workforce Liaisons and State Workforce Board Chairs. You can see that on the slide. 
they are um, looking at the partnerships between state, federal, business, education, training provider, and training providers, and basically about the importance of WIOA dollars. Well, we all know that WIOA dollars are really important, and they come out talking about the importance of building on WIOA as a foundation and about state flexibility. Again, we all know that, that WIOA is important, I just think this is a great study to use to be able to show people the importance of WIOA, the importance of the money that comes into the state from WIOA, um, and how you, in fact, are using WIOA dollars to employ folks with disabilities. Um, if you're a provider or if you're a family member or a person with a disability, how important those dollars are to you. This is, um, again, in this environment, jobs are important and talking about jobs are important. And this gives you one way of talking to your state policymakers, your governor, since it comes partly from the National Governors Association, about the importance of employment for people with disabilities and the importance of WIOA. Okay, next slide. This is another one that is, um, there we go. This is another one that talks about WIOA. This one's um, from Pete, which I'm pretty sure you're most, most of you are, are aware of out of um, Department of Labor, the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology. Um, this, again, talks about the importance of WIOA and accessible technology within the American Job Center. The American Job Centers are those centers that are used for all employment, not just people with disabilities. And I think this is another way, something that's come out again that you can use. It shows disability accessibility checklists. There's presentation decks on accessible, transportation, accessible tech. We're going to be talking about transportation later fact sheets for AJCs to use. I think it's a great introductory, um, they're great introductory materials to take into your local AJC and say, hey, did you know this? Here are the advantages. I mean, here are the information that's available out there. We can help you with this. We know how to do this because those of you are, interest, are on this phone call because you're interested in um, employment of people with disabilities. You know how to do this. And you can be their expert. And not only that, but you have a brand new piece of material that you can take in and say, and this is brand new and I brought it in to show you. So again, leverage with your AJCs in this case. Next slide, Deb. The next one, um, you, may, you may have thought of, have seen this, I hope so, um, but it, you may not have thought about it in quite this way. The new Disability Equality Index is out. This one is a joint partnership between um, the U.S. Business Leadership Network um, USBLN and AAPD, the association, the American Association of People with Disabilities. They've been doing this since 2013. They do a whole survey of employers. Um, there, this year there were 110 corporations involved um, looking at disability equality within that corporation. Next slide, Deb. Um, what they found this year, and again, this is another one I think that you can use to take into employers in your area and leverage your expertise in working with new employers. So the good news for these 110, and it lists, it also lists best places to work based on this survey. And it's another way of going into a large employer in your area, maybe one that you're trying to break into to do some, some um, employment services, uh, maybe one you're trying to be employed by, depending on who you are out there. But I think it's a great way to go in and say, hey, here are the places in the, in the country who are some of the best places to work if you're a person with a disability, they really pay attention to these things. Here are the things they pay attention to, and don't you want to be on this list? And I can help you get there. So again, think leverage when you see this. Um, I, I can review the, you know, the good news. There's, there's lots of um, programming focused on disability inclusion in these, uh, and focus on employee retention in these top 100 companies. There's uh, there are places for improvement, um, as you can imagine. There, particularly once you get beyond the corporation into suppliers, the diversity of suppliers is not is not good. We need to improve that. We need to improve the advancement policy. That's not going to be a, a surprise to anybody here. Um, interview accommodations. I don't think that's going to be a surprise to anybody on the slide either. They do better at accommodations. Um, corporations are doing better at accommodations once you get into the workplace. But in, interview accommodations, not so good. Um, internal website auditing, that's another one I don't think is going to be a surprise to any pe person on this call. But the point is you all understand all of these things and you can go in and help them. And I think this is a great leveraging tool for you. Next slide, Deb. Um, and lastly, this is one also that I'm, 
I don't know if you've seen it, but again, um, this is from uh, WinTAC and NTAC, the Workforce Innovation Technical Assistance Center and the National Technical Assistance Center. No, that's transition. There's a word missing there. National Transition Technical Assistance Center. Um, again, it's part of the implementation of WIOA that they had to come out with this study, this um, toolkit. And it's about how to do an interagency agreement between state education agencies and state VR agencies. Um, again, I'm not sure this is something you would have necessarily focused on directly, but I think it's a great way to be able to get an entree and to prove yourself to be the expert with your state education agencies and VR agencies. And given the requirements in WIOA about transition age youth and the spending of money on transition age youth, um, I think this is a fabulous way to let's say nudge um, some of your departments in the right direction. And you have a toolkit, you have a way to do it, you can show them examples, you become the expert and you can leverage that into other things in the future. So um, that's, that's the leverage piece in that one. Next one, Deb. I just wanna hit on a couple of things quickly. Um, this one is, is personal to me on some level because I also, I work on a project for Think College Think College has done a whole new web redesign. If you don't know about Think College, um, it's a program about um, post-secondary education, inclusive post-secondary education for students with intellectual disabilities. They have completely redesigned their website. There's all kinds of information up there about state programs. There are 263 of these programs around the country right now. It can tell you about every one of those, a little bit of information, more information. It talks about state legislation. There are some new affinity groups. There's one on vocational rehabilitation that's just starting. Um, there's one that I run on public policy. That's the next call for that one's the 21st of September, but you can go and play around on the website and look, but I want you to know that it's, um, it's really well done, easy to navigate, and we're really excited about it. Um, that was the point of personal privilege. Next one, next slide, Deb. Um, a couple other things that are just so that you see them. There it is. Um, there are two, there you go. Um, there are two new projects. There's a project and then a webinar that goes with it just out of Georgetown University Center for, for Child and Human Development. Um, embedding cultural diversity and cultural and linguistic competence, um, a guide for use of curricula and training activities. This is, um, it, out, as I say, out of Georgetown. Really well done. They've been working on it for a long time. It's funded by AIDD. It's something that, again, I think, and flip to the next slide then, Deb. There, uh, there's a webinar then coming up as well on community education and information dissemination, um, uh, considerations for cultural and linguistic differences. Again, I think these are things that we can all use all the time, whether they're focused in one particular way about the USAID piece, or whether it's focused on, this is on community education and information dissemination, which I know you all are about. Um, this is an important one that we need to be paying more attention to. And in fact, um, I think these are going to be, and this webinar, by the way, just a note, you can see it's coming up this coming Tuesday, uh, but you can sign up for it. There's going to be more around this um, in, the, in the future. The folks at Georgetown have a whole set of things that they're rolling out. This is just the beginning, but, um, but I want to draw it to your attention in case you haven't seen it. That's all of mine really quick today, and thank you so much. Um, why don't we flip to the next slide, Deb? Yeah, and one more. So one of the things that we like to do every month is interview somebody who is actually out in the, a person with a disability who's actually out in the world and is employed. Um, I think it's a good way of talking about a variety of employment issues that people face. It's a good way of reminding all of us that there are real people behind the numbers we talk about. Um, I think it's a good way to, um, well, I'm talking too much. Let's go to Aaron. So Aaron Hawley is my interviewee today. Erin is, um, and she'll talk some more about this, but she's a digital content producer for Easter Seals. Um, I ran across Erin first actually through her, um, her blog, The Geeky Gimp, and she can talk more about that as well. So Erin, are you there? Yeah, hello. Hi Erin. So Erin, um, why don't you, first of all, let's just start out. Why don't you talk for a minute about your disability? Sure, um, I have muscular, dystrophy and I've had that since I was a child and I also have anxiety which was diagnosed about uh, two years ago 
So both of those affect my job and my work and how I navigate the workforce. So Erin, tell me a little bit about the job that you're doing now. And, um, but why don't we start with that? Tell me a little bit about the job you're doing now. Right now I work for Easter Seals and the Easter Seals Thrive um, program. And we have a community online on social media to help young women with disabilities navigate, um, you know, big life transitions, like finding a job, going to college, getting into a relationship, all these things that need support. And that's what we focus on. And I also work for myself on the Gigi Gimp blog and brand. I talk about um, all the different nerdy things that I like, like comic books, video games, TV shows, and I talk about how disability intersects with those things. So, like I said, that was the first place I ever saw your name was through the Geeky Gimp. Yeah. Um, and then I realized you were working with Thrive and with the folks at Easter Seals. Um, Thrive is a fabulous program for, for young women. I will put another plug in for Easter Seals Thrive, and there's a link on the... Uh, on this, the slides if you're looking for those. Um, so Erin, talk to me about, uh, talk about some of the barriers that you found to employment. Um, some of your job experiences, um, things that people should know about, could know yeah. about, might be useful. Yeah, so after I graduated college in 2006, I got a job at um, a state office and I had to leave that job four months later because my dad's insurance said if I was working, I'm not disabled. And they threatened, they threatened to cut my nurses, my medical equipment, so I had to leave. And then I didn't have a job until 2015. I started for Easter Seals mm -hmm. because I didn't know that I could work. I thought if I worked, I would lose everything. So I discovered the New Jersey Workability Program that allows people with disabilities to work and earn an income and keep their Medicaid. And Another barrier I face is transportation. I can't really, I don't have reliable transportation. So I have to work from home. And finding a job to work from home is really difficult. So, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so tell me if you've got... I'm also curious because I know you're working with Thrive and with the young women there. What are what are some of the kinds of things that they're talking to you about, about barriers to employment? Well, a lot of them have trouble, you know, accessing the education they need to get a job. And they have trouble, um, you know, just the whole interview process is often not accessible. And just, you know, maintaining a regular schedule is hard for a lot of people. So those are the big issues that come up. So tell me what you want to do. What's your future look like? Meaning, what, what's your big goal in the next five years? Or, you know, talk to me about where, unless you want to be at Easter Sales forever, and that's cool too. But what, what's your... What, what are your plans? What do you want to do? So, I mean, I love Easter Seals. But <laughs> yeah, I don't mean that to be a negative at all. Right, right, like, yeah. I'm uh, yeah, I'm really fortunate to work there. But 
my my ideal job would be to do my Gigi Gimp stuff, you know, all the time. Mm-hmm. That's like that's where my passion is. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to monetize it so I can, you know, do that full time. Eventually, one day, I hope. <laughs> Have you always lived in New Jersey? Yep. Same, okay. same house, same oh, town. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was just going to ask if you'd had any of those same, because I know people have different issues in different states based mm-hmm. upon what their, uh, what that state allows. New Jersey has workability. Some other states do have similar things. Some don't. So um, yeah. I was curious if you've been through it elsewhere. Well, yeah, I didn't. I actually, they don't tell you about workability like i had to find that on my own and it's like if you don't know about it then you can't take advantage of it right you know so i think that's another issue is people just don't know what's out there right yeah yeah i think that's true too Mm -hmm. um any last words last thoughts last words of advice for uh, people listening about employment of folks with disabilities, about um, barriers um, and being beyond those barriers, how you get through them. It's not so much the barriers as Mm -hmm. right now, how we change them. Well, my advice would be just to do a lot of research, go online, Mm -hmm. see what your state offers. Um, There's a lot of different search engines too for people with disabilities to find jobs. So do that research and get out there and hopefully find something for you. Cool. Thanks so much, Erin. I really appreciate it. That's been been fabulous. Thank you for having me. Um, Well, like I said, I think it's important to have an interview with a person every month and that's important. Um, I'd like to introduce, next I'd like to introduce Donna Smith, who is our speaker for the day. Uh, our uh, second speaker for the day. Um, I'm getting a note that says my internet is unstable, so I'm hoping you guys can still hear me. Um, So Donna is the Senior Director for Easter Seals Project Action Consulting. Yep, there it goes. Um, She, Donna, since my internet is unstable, I'm gonna just toss it to you and let you go for it so that in case I lose this, you guys can keep going, okay? I had a very nice long introduction and Donna is one of my favorite people and she's fabulous at what she does on transportation, <laughs> but I'm a little worried. So I'm going to toss it to you, Donna. No problem, Dee. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to be a part of this um, lunch and learn session. Um, I am Donna Smith and I'm the senior director for Easter Seals Project Action Consulting. And we'll be talking a little bit more about, um, Uh, what that is uh, as we go forward. And I'm very happy to be here today to talk about independent mobility um, and the critical role that that plays with employment. Um, I do realize that employment is the focus of this call. However, you could substitute housing, education, recreation, healthcare, aging in place, um, and the, the information would be just as true in those situations as well. Transportation just touches everything. Next slide, please. I'm going to run through these next three slides, uh, three or four, pretty quickly. These are about the issues um, that uh, that we have with transportation, and um, most of you probably know all of these, so I'm not going to belabor it. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. So people with disabilities are twice as likely to lack transportation as their peers without disabilities. People who live in poverty spend a higher percentage of income on transportation and people with disabilities are more likely to live in poverty than people without disabilities. Um, So that kind of sets up that part of it for us. Next slide, please. Um, The issues continue. 40% of the rural population have no public transportation. Um, Rural transportation may have significant limitations even when it does exist things like hours of operation, geographic scope that it covers, and the really long distances that exist um, in rural areas when trying to get into these centers that have 
um, the services or activities that we might want to participate in. Next slide, please. Um, finally, there is still a significant lack of access in the uh, physical environment. So this is the pedestrian environment. Um, people with disabilities may not be may not have the skills they need in order to use available transportation, and people with disabilities may not have the information regarding um, all transportation options. We were just hearing from Aaron that sometimes it can be difficult to uh, actually figure out what really is out there, and that's true with transportation as well. Next slide, please. So I've broken these into four broad categories, and this is kind of the way we talk about, um, in general terms, the barriers uh, that exist for transportation or the things that we need to work on. So the first one is the availability of transportation options. Second is the accessible pedestrian pathway. Third is the information um, about all transportation options. And then finally, um, the skills uh, that we need in order to be able to use those, all of those transportation choices when they are available to us. Next slide, please. We're going to talk about these, uh, each of these categories um, um, and, and some potential things that, that are being done and that could be done about it. So first of all, just increasing transportation options. It's important to know that transportation really happens at the local level. So the decisions about what kind of transportation is going to be there, what the scope of that service is going to be, how many types of transportation might be out there, all of that happens at the local level. Um, local funds are needed to match the federal dollars available. This is not uh, unique to transportation, um, but it is certainly a piece that the local community has to decide um, to come up with that match in order to be able to utilize the federal dollars. Um, coordination uh, with the human service transportation. There's a lot of, of transportation that's actually funded by the HHS instead of the DOT. Um, and these often uh, result in human service agencies uh, either serving people with disabilities or older adults or people of lower income. Um, and they uh, develop transportation to meet the needs of their clients and their services. So if uh, someone needs to be able to get into, to and from um, employment service uh, training programs, um, they may have transportation available to help folks get to and from those programs, but it's not available to get those same people to the grocery store, for instance. Um, and then there are emerging transportation models out there and the concern about whether or not they're accessible. So I'm talking about the uh, new share ride type programs that are out there like the transportation network companies of Uber and Lyft, and truly there are just a whole long list of these types of ride sharing programs. Uh, Liberty Now is one that's available in rural areas um, in a lot of places. And so uh, these are great. They're new models. They're new ways of looking at transportation, creating more options. Uh, but we uh, need to make sure that access to those uh, options for people with disabilities is in place as well. And we're seeing um, as these things develop that it's not there from the start. And so it's going to take a certain amount of effort um, and advocacy in order to make sure that, um, <clears throat> that access is built into those options. And I would just add to the mix that the uh, autonomous vehicles is certainly um, in this mix of things as well. It's, it's a growing industry and uh, we need to be in there with a strong voice saying access for people with disabilities. Where does that um, line up with this newer form of transportation that we'll be seeing more of uh, as years go by? Um, next slide, please. This is um, information about the National Center for Mobility Management. This is a program that's funded by the Federal Transit Administration, and it's a project that's uh, housed jointly with Easter Seals, the American Public Transit Association, and the Community Transportation Association of America. Uh, three leaders uh, around disability and transportation. Um, their website is full of a lot of information about that human service transportation, how to coordinate it, how to get the best use out of it, um, those kinds of things. So uh, please check out um, uh, NCMM's uh, website for uh, more information about what they have to offer. They also do technical assistance um, and provide uh, training. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I'm going to move into pedestrian access now. Pedestrian access, uh, so accessible pathways for uh, pedestrians is covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act as well as Section 504 of the Rehab Act. 
And the Federal Highway Administration has some regulations about this and some guidance, um, all that support access for people with disabilities as pedestrians. And so I've given you their website. This particular link will take you to a series of uh, uh, regulations, guidances, uh, FAQs, um, helpful materials that talk about um, what's required in the way of accessible pedestrian pathways. Next slide, please. The FHA, uh, FHWA also covers, um, talks about transition plans. So any public agency with more than 50 employees, so let me just say that again, any public agency with more than 50 employees must have a transition plan under the ADA. That's been in effect since 1992. Um, and it was in effect prior to that under Section 504 of the Rehab Act if these public agencies were receiving federal funds. Um, it's taken a long time for this to kind of start to flesh out to be what, what the intent was uh, in the ADA. Um, it's based on a self-evaluation. Um, and they anticipate that the plans would be updated periodically. Um, and it requires public input. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about those things in just a minute, especially public input. Next slide, please. Transition plans must include, uh, they must identify the physical obstacles that limit access to their programs and services by people with disabilities. Um, they, they're also supposed to describe in detail the methods to create access, so they identify those obstacles and then they, the plan shows how they plan to alleviate them. Um, it should specify a timeline, so this is not just a plan to be written and, and put on the shelf to collect dust. Uh, there's a timeline for implementation, and it should indicate who is responsible for that plan so that you know who to get in touch with uh, when this is something that needs to be discussed locally. Um, again, this is another link to the FHWA website, and it's a, a Q&A about who has responsibilities for accessible pedestrian environments under the um, Americans with Disabilities Act in Section 504, and it's, it's pretty thorough. It's a, it's a good resource to bookmark. Next slide, please. So transportation planning covers both of these issues that I've talked about already, the availability of transportation and access in the pedestrian environment. Um, all of that is covered in the transportation planning process. Uh, it happens at the state, local, and regional levels. Um, for planning transportation. There's a very strong federal emphasis uh, on public involvement, so they not only want them to, um, to do their planning with regard to um, all of the typical stakeholders around transportation, but they're also very interested in making sure that the public has a say uh, in what's going on there. Um, and transportation planners need to hear from your perspective. They need to hear from professionals in the field of disability services about what's going on out there. It's pretty easy to become the go-to professional uh, for information around access for people with disabilities if you get involved in some way in, the, in transportation planning. Um, transportation planning is multi-layered uh, is probably the best way to describe it. Um, and I just don't have time to get into what all those layers are at this point. But the Institute for Traffic Engineers uh, have a good uh, web page on, on uh, transportation planning and kind of how all of those how all of those pieces uh, roll in together. So I've given you a link to that. Next slide please. We're going to move on to increasing awareness of transportation options. Um, we do a lot of community events where we bring together people with disabilities and transportation providers and human service providers to look at what are the transportation barriers locally. And one of the things that always comes up, and I do mean always comes up, is that there is uh, transportation out there that people with disabilities and older adults simply just don't know is there. Um, so one of the things that has uh, been a pretty, pretty big effort over the last 10 years or so is to establish one call, one click services. So just one place where a person can reach out and find out not just about public transportation and where those routes go, but what other kind of transportation is out there, what, who, who's eligible for it, what does it cost, uh, what kind of uh, service does it provide, when and where does it go, and it's all in one place. 
ride guides can do the same thing. So uh, places that don't have the, um, the hardware and the staff at this point to do a one call, one click service can just create really um, <clears throat> thorough ride guides. Mobility managers, we talked about mobility management on a previous slide. Um, these are professionals who are often responsible for pulling together all of that information that would be a part of a one call, one click uh, service or be put into a ride guide. Um, aging and Disability Resource Centers also collect this kind of information, um, so that'd be a place to go. Travel trainers, we're going to talk about travel training very shortly, uh, but these are professionals also who uh, often have that level of information about exactly what's available. Next slide, please. So the uh, National Research and Training Center on Blindness and Low Vision housed at Mississippi State University um, under a, uh, their previous grant had a, 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 a project specific to transportation and employment of people um, who are blind or have low vision. Um, they created this guide called a Transportation Guide for Persons Who Are Blind or Have Low Vision. Um, it's pretty thorough. Um, it's actually very thorough, and uh, it, while it's specific to people who are blind or have low vision, it's very easily adaptable to people with any type of disability or just anybody who needs information about uh, how, if you don't drive a car, how do you get out there and make the best of everything that's available to you? Um, so this link will take you not only to that guide, but also the other products and research that was developed out of that grant as well. Next slide, please. Um, the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center is a national uh, uh, training and technical assistance center specific to transportation um, and is funded by the Federal Transit Administration. It is uh, held jointly between Easter Seals and the National Area Agencies on Aging. Um, and this is their contact information. You have a phone number, an email address, their website. Um, their website has, I don't know, 70 or 80 uh, free downloadable resources all about mobility and transportation um, and people with disabilities and older adults. It's very thorough. Um, I would uh, certainly urge you to bookmark that if there are things that you need to know specifically about uh, pathways or accessible taxis or those kinds of things, public transportation, paratransit. Um, and then you can call their hotline for uh, uh, technical assistance, again, free of charge if you have questions can't find something you need, uh, want to know how the regulations apply, you can call in and ask. Next slide, please. <clears throat> this brings us to the fourth category of issues, uh, which is probably the one that I'm most passionate about, and it's increasing travel skills. So research as recent as 2015 indicates that people with disabilities who have good travel skills are significantly more likely to be employed six years post high school. And this is what we want to hear. This is what we want to have happen. Um, uh, you know, I just don't know any other way to say this. It's, 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 it's not rocket science. It's just really clear that if you want to get employed and stay employed, you need to have good travel skills to make use of whatever's out there. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Orientation and mobility, or O&M, um, is the profession that teaches people who are blind independent travel. So this is all about how to use the white cane or residual vision that you may have if you're low vision. Um, and uh, it's been around since the early 20th century. It's a very recognized, established profession. There's uh, certification processes for it, master level programs. Uh, and it's provided as an integrated part of special education and rehabilitation services for people who are blind or have low vision. That to me is the critical piece, um, even as long ago as when I was in school, so in the 60s, um, and then in the 70s, mid 70s, when I was trans uh, transitioning, uh, that was before they called it that, but I was transitioning from uh, high school into college and then later into work. Um, I didn't have to ask for or seek out O&M training. It was just a part of the training that was available to me. And I can tell you without any exaggeration whatsoever that these are skills that I have used my entire adult life every day. And not only that, but I would not have, I, I would have been much more limited um, about my employment options if I didn't have good travel skills. So uh, as a person who's blind, the only way 
that I could consider and pursue and get and retain um, a job that requires travel around the country is if I had good travel skills to begin with. Um, so I just can't emphasize enough the importance of that training. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so travel training is the profession that teaches people with disabilities other than blindness to travel independently. Um, it's been becoming a recognized profession over the last 20 years or so. Um, and Easter Seals has uh, worked with the field of travel trainers to develop a certification program. Um, and I've given you our website here that will talk about the certification program and the courses that have been developed um, to help people become travel trainers. Um, it's been around longer than 20 years. Uh, the, some of the earliest, uh, some of the earliest programs we know of occurred in the 60s, um, and uh, are still going on today. Um, and any of us who have ever done direct service in uh, disability field uh, know that whatever it is that we're working on. So, if we're helping people to gain employment skills, seek work, then it's also part of our jobs. To, uh, to handle the transportation part of it too and see what we can do to help a person get comfortable with that kind of travel. Um, but the, the profession of travel training has really formalized that uh, with some uh, credentialing and some real specific training. Next slide, please. These are some of the things that travel training includes. It starts with a baseline assessment of existing skills. Um, it, you create an instructional plan um, and then uh, monitor that progress ongoing. It teaches physical, sensory, and social skills needed to uh, use whatever transportation is available. Um, it goes through problem solving and judgment calls. Um, and then learning to use all available options, so not just public transportation, but how to be a safe and effective pedestrian, um, how to use uh, taxis, how to use human service transportation, whatever options are available in the community, um, uh, travel training looks at how to use all of that. Next slide, please. Um, who provides travel training? So schools, and particularly in their transition programs, uh, can, can and do uh, have travel training programs. Um, it can certainly start, travel training can certainly start much earlier than transition age. Um, the, the more a, a person with a disability or a child with a disability has access to information about navigating their environment um, and uh, having that sense of space and their orientation to it. The earlier that can start, the better. Uh, but mostly what we're seeing these days is that um, travel training is, is uh, considered a specific service that some schools, and not nearly enough, but some schools uh, offer to transition age uh, youth with disabilities. VR programs, both public and private, uh, can offer uh, transport, uh, travel training, and they, they do. And then human service agencies who uh, are serving people with disabilities or older adults uh, may offer travel training. Transportation agencies are, uh, have, has been a pretty quickly growing uh, area where travel trainers are provided, and the reason they do that is because um, it's um, more cost effective to train people with disabilities to use the fixed route system than to continue to transport the majority of people with disabilities using paratransit uh, service. Um, that's probably the primary reason why it's had such a big growth. One of the other obvious benefits, of course, is that um, it gives a person much more freedom of choice and independent of movement um, to be able to just go out and use fixed route when they when they can. And then centers for independent living also often have uh, travel training programs as well. Next slide, please. Um, these are just a couple of uh, examples. North Texas Travel is a program that had got three years of funding uh, with our Easter Seals affiliate in North Central Texas, serving a 16 county region. And during that three year period, um, they provided uh, ride guides for uh, all of the counties that were interested, and they also uh, provided, um, uh, brought us down to do uh, travel training uh, workshops for their folks um, in, the, in the region, and uh, then they also entered them into our certification program. Um, and so while the funding for this particular project uh, went away last year, um, they left uh, in the wake of that program quite a few professionals, teachers, VR counselors, transit providers, other human service uh, uh, staff, um, who are now um, 
either fully trained as travel trainers or well on their way to being fully trained as travel trainers. Chicago Public Schools, Easter Seal started working with CPS back in 2012, 2013 uh, to develop a travel training program for their school. It was quite successful. And even though CPS um, went through quite a lot of cuts uh, shortly after this program was in place, they did not cut the travel training program. Um, and again, um, you know, the, the primary reason for that uh, is that there was a, a proven cost benefit to the schools to keep it because if they could train students to take public transit to and from work in Chicago, I'm sorry, to and from school in Chicago, then uh, they could, um, th that would release them from the specialized transportation for those students, which is always more expensive. And then the Alamo Area, uh, Alamo Area uh, Council of Governments, that's in um, San Antonio, they also got a grant to uh, put uh, to do travel training in San Antonio and Bear County, um, and they brought the courses in for for their folks and uh, the, and started getting them certified. Um, again, the uh, COG itself does not provide travel training, but they support these other agencies, uh, nonprofits who are interested in travel training. And then Pierce Transit is an example of the transportation providers who provide um, travel training. This particular program has been in place for 20 or 25 years, and it's certainly one of the um, um, well-recognized programs uh, sponsored by a transportation provider in travel training. There are others as well, but this is just one of the examples. Next slide, please. So what can we do? That's always important to know. Um, I urge you to, whenever possible, to strongly advocate for the inclusion of travel training and transition and employment programs. Um, I don't think any of us are confused about the importance of that level of skill, um, but making it a more regular part of the services that are offered to people with disabilities uh, uh, other than blindness and low vision um, is something that just really needs to be stepped up. Um, in terms of, of helping folks gain that independence. And then get involved with transportation planning at whatever level is appropriate for you. So whatever your um, career focus is, whatever your involvement in the community is, look at what part of the planning process is, uh, is helpful. They are seriously starving for input from um, uh, both people with disabilities and professionals that work in the field, and so it's really a good opportunity for you to be the voice of access in your community around transportation. Next slide, please. This is how you can stay in touch with Easter Seals Project Action Consulting. Um, and then finally, the last slide, I just want to thank you for having me here. This has my contact information. I know I've gone through this quickly, but you have my email address here, which is dsmith at easterfields.com, and I'm more than happy um, to respond to questions or uh, if you're looking for resources, that sort of thing. I'm happy to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Donna. That was great information to share. So many resources, as you mentioned. I wanted to remind people that all of the slides from our presentations today will be shared on our website after this concludes so you can access information there um, and if anyone had any questions that they wanted to ask feel free to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at this point. Um, I had one question for Donna as a follow-up you mentioned a lot about travel training and possible ways that people could access that. Could you say a little bit about how available that is on a state-to-state -state or local area, local area basis? Do you see a lot of differences in availability? Yes, it's, it's, uh, it varies widely. So for instance, the state of Massachusetts has uh, put a really strong focus in a statewide uh, capacity with regard to uh, building up travel training services and the availability of those services in that state. Um, you're not seeing that in most states. Um, and so just like uh, transportation uh, is a very local, um, very locally focused, uh, travel training tends to be as well. Um, I think, you know, we see it in schools here and there, but nothing consistent across the board. I don't know of any state that has said, all of our schools will embrace travel training for transition age youth, um, that sort of thing. So it is real piecemeal, and there's not currently um, um, any kind of uh, registry 
for travel trainers around uh, the country. It's something that Easter Seals may um, take under consideration at some point in the future if we feel like we can, so that it is easier to find them. Um, but you can always start with your transportation agency. They're likely to know. Um, and then if, you, if you're having trouble uh, figuring out what might be available in your area, please call us um, at Project Action or at NADTC. We're a lot of the same folks. <laughs> so just call us and we'll be happy to help you track down what's available. Thank you again. Any of our other panelists have any questions or final comments they'd like to give? I have a quick question. This is John O'Neill uh, for Don. Don. I was wondering if you um, have any information or could comment on the uh, litigation that might be going on around the country regarding uh, accessible transportation. So are you referring to as it particularly applies to the transportation network companies? That's kind of a hot button. Is that yeah. what you're asking about? Yeah. Sure. So, okay, so I'm not an attorney. I have to always say that right up front. Um, but uh, there are two, um, there's been a lot of, of uh, lawsuits filed uh, specific to denying service animals and Uber and Lyft and those kinds of things. But the two ones to watch, the two current uh, cases to watch, there's one in Chicago and one out of D.C., um, and they both, uh, in the end, will address the issue of exactly how applicable is the Americans with Disabilities Act to those types of ride-sharing programs. Um, what, we, what we've heard from those companies uh, for the last couple of years now is, oh, we're, we don't provide transportation, we provide an app that uh, connects people to transportation, therefore, those transportation rules about the ADA don't apply to our company. Uh, we're just the app provider. Um, and uh, that has not held up in the court decisions that have, um, have come through already uh, and the settlement agreements that have been made. Um, they have always had to make adjustments and uh, take steps to uh, implement information for their drivers about how to provide access. So that, um, uh, has not held up for them very strong so far, uh, but these two cases out of Chicago and D.C. Uh, will both uh, really help to define that. Um, and the Department of Justice, to my knowledge at this point, has not uh, issued a, a solid opinion on that, although they have um, supported some of the um, suits that have been brought against Uber and Lyft uh, previously. Thank you. That's very helpful. Sure. And Donna, we had one question from our audience uh, or comment. They were saying in Cleveland, many families opt to use paratransit because they feel it is safer than traveling on fixed route. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a fairly common perception. What, uh, the public transit has uh, suffered a bit over the years in terms of uh, people considering it to be a safe and desirable mode of transportation. I don't think that that's true uh, necessarily. I think that um, public transit has made uh, a tremendous effort to uh, make sure that their vehicles are clean and their service is good. Um, you know, you you can't do much about. You know, it needs it needs to certainly go through all parts of of town or the county or whatever area they serve. And so there's not much you can do about the fact that there are um, stops and and uh, parts of towns that may not. Uh, be real safe. Um, but I think to the extent that it can be, um, uh, transit has done a lot to try to reverse that image. And, and then you have the issue of families uh, often being a little over, um, over concerned, over protective um, of uh, people with disabilities who are in their family, um, not wanting, um, you know, just preferring that door-to-door -door service because it's, uh, it seems to be easier and safer and, and they're more comfortable with it. But I think you have to look at it from the standpoint of those of us with disabilities. Um, the requirements for uh, being eligible for paratransit are pretty strict. The, um, uh, the issues around scheduling and having to uh, book trips a day in advance and having to negotiate for the pickup times and having to wait um, in some cases a while before you get picked up. 
those kinds of things um, don't don't uh, go well for a spontaneous life, and it also doesn't help a lot with if you're sitting in your office and all of a sudden you need to be at a meeting at some other part of town, you're not going to be able to schedule paratransit for that. So I think that there's a need for paratransit and that it'll, that's not going to go away anytime real soon. Um, but I think that there are a tremendous number of people currently eligible for and using paratransit um, who uh, uh, have the ability uh, to be able to use uh, the fixed route system. And, and quite frankly, as an advocate with disability, um, you know, we fought to get uh, the ADA passed to have equal access to public transportation services. We won that fight, and I think it's our uh, our responsibility to use it to the extent that we can. Um, and I, I feel pretty strongly about that. Thank you again, Donna, and thanks to our whole team today. We need to wrap it up, um, but I appreciate everyone participating, and I appreciate the audience. Uh, joining us today. We do have a brief survey. If you could give some feedback about the presentation today, what you liked and didn't like, what we could improve upon, we would appreciate it. And we will see you next month.